Hi, I'm Michael Ashley from the Center for Digital Archaeology, and it's my pleasure today to talk to you about archival 3D photography. The Center for Digital Archaeology is a 501c3 nonprofit California organization dedicated to making it as easy as possible for individuals and organizations to fully realize the potential of digital technology with the least reliance on experts as possible. We have events and training opportunities going on all the time, so I would encourage you to check out our website or subscribe to our mailing list to keep informed. In this tutorial, I'm going to be focusing on 3D imaging or photogrammetry. I will delve into how it works, talk a bit about its history, show some practical examples, and walk us through the process. Along the way, we will look at some of the gotchas and the essentials that you need to know to get started, which are surprisingly minimal. Finally, I will discuss our Born Archival Imaging workflows that will help you get fantastic results and give you some tips on where to go from here. So let's jump right in and take a look at some examples. These are objects, or rather, they're three-dimensional representations of objects that are very well suited for 3D archival imaging techniques. Depending on the object, there will be different requirements for the environment, the amount of photos that you'll need to take, and the way in which these photos are taken. But all of this is definitely learnable, and thanks to some remarkable advances in just the last few years, it's also very affordable for the first time in history. So this is Sven Hankinson, now at the Burke Museum, and he described at the recent Sustainable Heritage Network workshops how he used photogrammetry of boat models found in Russia to help build a full-scale replica of this boat and bring it back to Kodiak Island for the first time. And it was a fantastic community event, and he learned this technique himself and produced something that's really, truly remarkable. Until recently, a lot of what we thought about when we talked of photogrammetry was about two-dimensional aerial photographs. But now it has become rather common, especially in archaeology and cultural heritage, to document places using what is called close-range photogrammetry, by either using a pole or a monopod, flying a drone or a kite, but we can actually bring the resolution down even further and reveal tremendous details at the ground level or even below the ground. So this is some archaeology from a Roman fort located in Israel. And what's even more interesting about this model is that this is actually an Adobe PDF file and the model has been embedded inside of it. So I am taking a look and just moving around here and I'm going to pull up a 3D tool built right into Adobe Acrobat, every version of Adobe Reader. And I'm going to go ahead and make a 3D measurement of this pipe. And what's really cool is that this measurement isn't in two dimensions. It's not measuring a photograph. It's actually measuring the distance of those two points in 3D. That's really cool. Generating two-dimensional but precisely measured orthographic photographs is also very useful for a variety of purposes, including GIS or geographical information systems. Here we have placed the ortho photos generated from our photogrammetry technique directly into our GIS. Because these 3D photographs have real-world coordinates and information inside of them, they just slip right into the GIS perfectly. In other words, each of these photos is perfectly aligned in real-world space. Now here's another close-up of one of those squares. And as useful as the two-dimensional orthophotos are for making measured drawings, the 3D models bring the site to life, but can also offer new perspectives of the excavation that would otherwise be impossible to represent. We can move around the 4x4 meter square and inspect the architecture from any angle. This is especially important in archaeology, where we really just have the one chance to get it right. Now, this imaging technique is useful for creating imagined places as well. It was used to develop the Star Wars game Battlefront, where the team would go out to locations such as this forest and take hundreds or thousands of photos to produce highly realistic backdrops and 3D models to populate the game. Let's take a quick look. Pretty amazing. But granted, not everyone is interested in producing 3D blow-up games. So what else can we do with 3D imaging? Well, once you realize how easy this technique actually could be, 
it becomes apparent that taking more photos, and especially photographing 3D imaging sequences, becomes a way to produce archival images and the knowledge in digital formats that is often irreplaceable. And we'll look at some more examples as we go along. These techniques will generate measurable models with exceptional precision and accuracy. This combined with some care around collecting information about color, texture, and other conditions produces a remarkable record. And these sequences are not difficult to replicate. So often photogrammetry is used for the documentation of objects, sites, and sacred places that are at risk or for more recurrent condition assessments, such as documenting rock art, where the art may be damaged over time due to weather, vandalism, or other factors. 3D imaging is particularly effective for education and research and sharing, and of course, it's actually a lot of fun. Now we're gonna take a slightly deeper dive into understanding what is necessary for conducting successful photogrammetry projects. I'd like to thank the team at Spark for providing some of the content in this tutorial that we're about to explore. So, photogrammetry is the art, science, and technology of obtaining reliable information about physical objects in the environment through the process of recording, measuring, and interpreting photographic images, and often, also electromagnetic radiant imagery, and we've heard things like LiDAR and other types of remote sensing techniques that do that. I'm gonna give a very brief history because photogrammetry actually predates photography. These principles go all the way back to da Vinci. And we have provided a beautiful timeline of historic events that have led to the modern advances in photogrammetry. And it's available as a presentation, as well as an interactive timeline in the iBook version of this tutorial. We'd highly recommend checking it out and taking five minutes to immerse yourself in the history of this fascinating scientific breakthrough. So a couple of brief highlights. In the early days, when we talked about photogrammetry, we were really just talking about aerial imaging. Generally, this was done by creating stereo pairs of images, two images with 80% overlap that, when combined, would produce a 3D effect. Because many of the features in each image are represented in both, these features can be measured, and those differences would help, help to derive the orthographic information in the images. Now let's move forward to the 1990s, where computer vision has afforded new capabilities for computer-based systems, but the systems were extraordinarily expensive. Generally, metric cameras, that, are, that is cameras that are specifically calibrated for the purposes of aerial imaging, were deployed, but again, this required a very complex process, expensive equipment, and highly trained personnel with basically no room for error. You either got it right or it just didn't work. But then, an algorithm was invented that dramatically improved the processing of images and basically broke the mold for how images were and are generated. Instead of following very strict rules of position, this technique of feature mapping depends on movement. In fact, it is based on the principles of structure from motion. So how does this work? Well, it's very similar to how we perceive the world. The more we move with our eyes, the better perception we have of the dimensionality of the subject. In other words, multiple vantage points from multiple cameras. And in this case, this renders a far better result than less images from particular static points of view. This makes it possible for humans to be very effective generators of precise 3D imaging for the first time. And this comes naturally to us because it's basically how human vision works for us in our everyday lives. So this SIFT algorithm, which I promise not to explain in any detail, came along and everything has changed since then. Now, automated close range photogrammetry is totally commonplace in documentation projects, and it really is time to learn about this remarkable technique. So let's talk about the essentials. Now you're gonna to need to take a lot of photos, lots and lots of photos from various angles, and this, it depends on what you're documenting. And essential to this is to have continuous photographic overlap between shots at close to 80%. That is, the photos are taken in a series where each photo overlaps the previous one, and the goal is to make sure that all of these photos in the same set overlap all the other ones in the set. This is where the magic happens. The software, guided by information derived from within the photos, the technical metadata that is captured automatically by the camera, plus some guidance by you, the human operator, processes the overlapping photos taken from different locations and automatically matches features that defines between the photos. 
The good news is that if you follow the rules, the entire process is almost completely automated. However, to derive an excellent quality 3D result, there is work to be done, which includes eliminating poor or incorrect matches between photos and other steps. But let's just not worry about that right now. So contiguous photos and lots of movement. And in this example, we're dealing with a really complex multi-dimensional object here. This is not a flat wall that we're seeing. It's gonna require a lot of photos with a lot of overlap taken from various angles to make sure that nothing is missed. It is essential that you move. So many people who begin learning this technique get confused because the second most popular technique for overlapping photographs is producing panoramas. With panoramas, you get a better result actually by not moving and by staying in place and simply moving the camera around in a circle around what's called the nodal point, like the top of a tripod, say. However, in order for the software to produce depth information, you need to move. If you close one eye and just move your head, you'll get the picture. Depth perception requires movement, and it is simply no different here. Lighting is also really important. The better the lighting, the better the result. Minimizing shadows and generally having even diffuse lighting makes a huge difference in the resulting imagery. As you can see in these photos, sometimes all it takes is a large shade and a person to move it because you're going to keep moving. And you can take that shadow with you. I personally also like to use a strobe or a flash with a diffuser, as you see in the example below, but definitely a subject for another time. So now we're gonna talk about the essentials of the equipment. You're going to be able to start with a modest camera, but you're not gonna get very good results if you try to do this with a tablet such as an iPad or a smartphone for reasons that I'll get into in a moment. You're going to need a digital SLR or a mirrorless camera to really do this. In other words, a decent point and shoot or a camera that can accommodate multiple lenses, preferably a camera that can shoot in camera raw and that has a decent sensor. And we'll cover all of this in a minute. And you're gonna to wanna to have a color checker, some form of known color chart that can be stuck somewhere in the scene. And the same goes for a scale bar that can be used for deriving the actual size of the subject that you're recording. When evaluating your camera, these are the things to look for. And it's almost impossible to buy a camera these days with less than eight megapixels, but I would be targeting 12 or more. The sensor size is super important and I'll cover that a bit more in a moment. And it's ideal that you can set the focus of the lens manually and try not to use autofocus. This is yet another reason why smartphones are such a hassle because it's very difficult, if not impossible, to manage focus. Now, whenever possible, you're gonna to wanna to shoot in camera raw. For the purposes of this tutorial, just trust me, it's truly the difference between an original painting and a Xerox copy in terms of the actual image quality. What you're seeing here, produced by these wonderful guys over at Petapixel, is the shot of the inside of the lens. So they have a lens cap on the, on the lens, so it would have been a black image. And when they processed it, this is the actual data. On the left-hand side, this right, nice, clean, contiguous data for the raw image on the right is all that noise that you just don't know is even there. It's, it's a fundamental difference in quality. Now, hard drive space is cheap in comparison to a lost opportunity to produce 3D imaging of a subject that might in fact be lost or damaged in the future. Other accessories to, to consider are tripods or monopods, remote cable releases or wireless shutters, and strobes, as we mentioned. Sadly, inexpensive cameras and almost all smartphones and iPads use something called a rolling shutter. Basically, it's the way that the photo is taken by the camera that renders an image that the photogrammetric software really just doesn't know what to do with. And this results in a poor model or complete failure. So this isn't to completely discourage you from trying, but there are is more and more software coming down the pike that will specifically be designed for smartphones. But at the time of this video, which is the early part of 2016, we would discourage using a smartphone or tablet as your primary documentation method and use an SLR or mirrorless camera instead. The results will just be so much better. Now, deep in each picture taken with almost every device is a whole lot of technical information that's really spectacular. Timestamps, the model of the camera, lens, information about coordinates, GPS, and all this. And all this information helps the software produce better models faster. So it's really important to use processing software, such as Adobe Lightroom, that doesn't erase this information. So a couple more tips. If your camera has digital zoom, don't use it. In fact, just don't ever use it because 
Digital zooming is really just cropping the image beyond the resolution that the, that the camera is capable of. And all this does is introduce noise and other far artifacts that makes your pictures look terrible. Just use the maximum zoom available from the lens and crop later. And for the purposes of photogrammetry, you're generally gonna be using a wider lens, so this really won't apply much. If at all possible, use what is called a prime lens, a lens with a particular focal length, such as 50 millimeters or 28 millimeters. But if you're going to use a zoom lens, you're going to set a particular focal length and lock it down. I like to use painter's tape, this blue tape, and just put it right on the barrel of the lens, on the side of the lens, and I lock the focus and the zoom when I am, in fact, I'm using a zoom lens. So once you've set the focus, once you set the zoom, don't change it at all. And if, you're in, if your camera has this thing called image stabilization, turn that off because it produces just a little bit of movement in the picture, and this causes the software to go into fits. Megapixels aren't everything, but they're really confusing for everybody. The actual size of the sensor really does matter. A typical smartphone has a very small sensor, which makes sense since it's a really small device. But ideally, you want a camera with at least an APS-C size sensor. Just, it's just an industry standard, as you can see right here. It's kind of in the middle. I personally like to have a full-frame sensor, but the reality is that full-frame cameras start at around $1,500 or more. You really can get fantastic results with something like a Canon Rebel or other cheaper digital SLR. We'll talk more about these at the end of the tutorial. The final model resolution, that is the quality and precision of the model depends on the pixel size, focal length, and working distance combo. If you think about this for a moment, it makes sense, right? The sensor defines the pixel size, and if you use a very wide angle lens, the amount of resolution will be less. And the further you are away, the less precise everything's gonna be. But generally, there's really no need to get obsessive about this, and the more that you practice, the more you'll come to an understanding of the right combination of these factors. It is out of the scope of this tutorial, but there are, in fact, many times where a smaller sensor will actually produce a better result, specifically with objects, so stay tuned. Now, without going too deep, we're going to take a look at the data processing pipeline. So you've taken your photos, you've processed them through something like Adobe Lightroom or a non-destructive equivalent, and now you've put these images and loaded them into the photogrammetry software. Now from here on out, we're just gonna talk about Agisoft PhotoScan because really, it's the only software we would recommend if you're new to this. We'll talk about more about software in a moment. So this is the basic processing pipeline. You take the photos, you bring them into the software. The software aligns the photos and generates what's called a point cloud, a collection of points in 3D space that has been magically derived from the images. This is then further processed by the software into a dense point cloud, and from there, the points are linked into what's called a mesh. Then texture and color information is added to the mesh, along with scaling the model, which you do as a process, um, with either using geo-references or GPS points or the, your actual scale bar. And finally, it's contextualizing and annotating the model so that it's actually useful for other people. Now, this may seem like a lot of steps, but almost all of these are done within the software package, so don't panic. But let's take a quick step backwards. I mentioned earlier how important it is to have a color checker somewhere in your scene. If you're interested in accurate color of your subject, and you should be, this is an essential step. Photoscan will actually try to fix the color if you tell it to, but I personally prefer to have complete control of this process, and so once again, Adobe Lightroom to the rescue. Now, if you photograph with color balance in mind, this whole process is so much simpler, and we're gonna cover color management in another tutorial. So let's demystify everything. What you're seeing here is a result of all the images being matched. The blue boxes represent each camera from 186 camera positions aligned by the software, and notice the tremendous overlap between the photos, but also notice that there are some gaps. The next step is to generate the sparse point cloud. Believe it or not, this is as easy as clicking a button inside the software. What you're seeing is not a photograph, but actually the underlying 3D data as a cloud of points. Now, additional processing will bring the sparse point cloud up to a dense set of points, and you really can go crazy with this and generate millions and millions of points, but generally, a million points or so is fine. Next, the software will generate a triangular mesh by joining the points together 
So in this model, we're seeing 12 million faces connected by over 6 million vertices. So it's really starting to look like a three-dimensional thing. It's starting to look like the object itself. The final processing step is to add back the texture, and we'll cover that in a different tutorial as well. So congratulations, these are the basics. For review, to really do this right, you're gonna need some modest gear. Color checker, small versions of which, like the one shown here, 10 bucks on amazon.com. You're gonna need an object of known length, something that you can use to scale the model. Shown here are the very cool color bars produced by Culture Heritage Imaging, which include these special targets that the software can read. This really makes everything a whole lot easier. You can create your own, and you can also just use other types of scale bars or any object that's easy to see in the photos and that you can measure. You wanna make sure that you shoot in camera raw whenever possible, and again, this is worthy of a complete additional tutorial. Now to ring in hope, I wanna mention that this camera, now discontinued, but the Sony NEX6 has all the features I mentioned. 12 megapixels, shoots camera raw, has an APS-C sensor, has manual focus. It has interchangeable lenses and can even accommodate a fixed lens. And it's available on eBay almost every day for less than $300. So we have about three of these around. In terms of shooting, you're gonna to want to lock that focus, lock your zoom, shoot with a fixed aperture. The aperture is how much light is being brought into the lens, preferably around f8 or smaller, so f8 or less light. <laughs> and that's to, to maximize the depth of field so that everything's in focus. You're gonna to want, want to lock the speed, and that is the, the sensitivity of the sensor itself to something of ISO 400 or less, if you can get away with that. And in some lighting conditions, that's gonna be difficult. And last but not least, you're gonna to wanna to lock the exposure if possible, but this last one is tricky. And in the real world where light is constantly changing, we typically let the camera choose the exposure, but everything else we lock down. As I mentioned, iPads and iPhones and other smart devices are not really up to the task, but they are fantastic for documentation. We let them do all the collection of the information that we also wanna have, such as the time of day, weather conditions, notes, purpose of the imaging, and anything else that you can think of. Finally, just to touch on the preview of an upcoming tutorial, Born Archival Imaging, I want to leave you with a sense of excitement and encouragement. We have successfully taught many people around the world how to do this whole technique. You're not alone, there's tons of help out there, and everything is just getting easier all the time. We really feel that this is the next revolution in photography, but moreover, generally for culture heritage documentation, and once you try it, it's really unlikely that you're not gonna love it. So this presentation is really part of a series of training materials, so I encourage you to check out the whole series and get in touch with any questions that you have. We would love to hear from you. Thank you so much.